Hi everyone, I'm Alex Fialo. I'm a second year PhD student in the history of art and African American studies. Uh, really excited to be moderating this conversation with the Living Things group um, of recent Yale MFA and sculpture graduates, Alex Zach, Corinne Smith, Lauren Lee, and Randy Renata. Um, I wanna mention M23 is the host of the interview and virtual exhibition. And you can, I wanna invite everyone to please um, check out the show on M23's website, uh, m23.co. Um, I'm happy to turn it over to Corinne, who's gonna give us a little bit more a context around how the exhibition came to be, and then we'll dive into um, the artists speaking about their work and our conversation. Thank you, Alex. Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. Thanks, everybody, for coming um, on time as well. <laughs> Rare sometimes with sculpture. Um, for this exhibition, I mean, M23 just reached out to me um, at, through Instagram, um, and they wanted to do this kind of online exhibition with sculpture, um, but we wanted to do it maybe um, a little bit differently than um, kind of some of the stuff that we've been seeing. And so we've partnered with um, Sorab Moebi, who um, led a discussion with the group and that will be um, transcribed and available very soon. Um, and we also decided to partner with the um, art historian PhD students at Yale to facilitate discussions and interviews with um, the artists in the show. And so this is the second uh, group interview and um, we are doing the interview under the theme living things. So each artist in this group, um, our work has something to do with um, or materially, conceptually, something to do with living things. Um, so yeah, um, I wanted to get started by just all of us kind of showing our work and talking about it briefly. Um, so. Let me share my screen. All right. So Lauren, take it away. Um, hi, I'm Lauren. Um, and this is the work I did in the fall of 2019. Uh, the title of which is Mother Cooking Steaks for Thick, ne Thick Necked Boys and uh, this is a detailed shot of the piece, um, and this was sort of about me negotiating um, this sort of musical chair of different roles that I felt like I was taking in my life at the moment. And this is also the beginning point of my interest in taxidermy and its process, which I'll talk about later. Um, and this. Yeah, thank you. This oh, if you want to go back, <laughs> just let me know when. <laughs> yeah, so um, a lot of the materials included here are taxidermy foams, um, as well as different parts used in taxidermy, and also uh, mounted and stuffed rabbits that I've done myself, but I've also um, collected from other taxidermists that I work with. And you can move on to the next page. Thank you. And this is the work that I did in the spring of 2019. And it's called Pita Pet, Stabbing Myself Through and Through with a Well-Bruised Banana. Um, and this is an installation done with um, customized shower curtains from Bad Bath and Beyond of uh, my watercolor drawings. And it also, this installation also involves um, three objects, which are used walkers and crutches. And also, um, I believe 84 casts of uh, different noses of 10 different men. Um, and those were done in paraffin waxes as long as, and as well as different organic materials. Wow, I really can't speak today, but. All good, we appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. That's sort of my, my work thus far. All right, Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is uh, my work. 
I'm Corinne Smith, by the way. Um, so this is the work that I presented for my thesis back in March before kind of the shutdown happened. Um, and the work is called Pinky and it is collagen with latex and double stick tape. And also the um, installation space I covered with um, a white plush carpet. Um, so that was, this is kind of the outside view. Um, as you can see, there's slits in the structure. And so as people walked around and, and viewed the work, um, the entire piece kind of um, moved in a wave-like motion, kind of depending on how fast people were moving around it. Uh, so within the structure, I had um, another sculpture inside that was an, a robotic butterfly is what I'm calling it, um, but it was a butterfly with two heads that I created and it flapped its wings on this um, cantaloupe half that um, it's a real cantaloupe path. So um, I replaced it about every three days um, just to prevent any sort of mold. Um, but there was kind of a smell in the room as well as the kind of the latex and collagen. Um, right next to that is also um, a latex, I'm gonna call it a stringer that went from the window of the gallery and then into the plush carpet. Um, so yeah, that, that's, that's my thesis work that is currently in the online exhibition. Alex? Hi. Um, I am Alex. Uh, this is um, an image of a sculpture that um, is currently called Chip of Fools that I started working on towards thesis and I was unable to complete um, as I haven't yet found like a, a full enough uh, space to really get to work on it since we were shut out of the studios at the school. But um, to give a little background and to the things that I'm interested in and thinking about, um, I am using sites of leisure or images of sites of leisure as like a way to navigate some of the deeper concerns that I have. Um, in thinking about uh, collapse and failure as like a way of like navigating like change or growth or like different issues uh, of ecology as all of these things I think are wrapped up um, in, in leisure spaces or the sites that we vacation to. So a lot of the times I'm using um, objects or, or material that, that come from those spaces or that uh, are, are identifiable as as leisurely sites, uh, like a lounge chair, for instance. And the snails on the chair are a direct reference to uh, Acatino land snails, which are giant um, giant land snails that are invasive in Southern Florida. So um, I'm usually researching and interested in quite a breadth of information about these spaces and about their histories, um, about the ecologies uh, of, the, of these sites. Uh, both in like the flora and fauna that are present, but also in the way that like, like the built environment or like the artifice of, of a leisure space sort of like dictates like, like how we understand or, or, or what is understood about, about the spaces we vacation to. Um, also could be described as a, um, a tourist imaginary. Um, is there a detail of this image? No, just uh, this other piece oh. here. Okay, so, um, so I was working on it. Couldn't really finish it. Uh, that was like an iPhone photo I took. <laughs> and this was the, the last thing that I finished in the fall called Swamped. Um, I think uh, I really took, um, took a chance in trying to like use material a little bit differently, continuing to play with different objects or um, machines that you'd normally find um, in these places. Uh, sort of like whether, whether it's like a place you vacation to or like something just within the home, like a ceiling fan, something that like brings like minimal comfort. Um, and compounding that with like all of these other objects um, to try and build an environment based off of uh, an office space, uh, a, 
a marooned island. Um, di di different different lo localities kind of um, collapse together in the image. Um, thinking about like housing or or the built environment again to a certain extent. Um, but mostly, I guess what I'm interested in doing with this is again exploring collapse uh, and failure as a way to pursue and explore the these sites as as as, as, as like a living thing, as, as as something, as a subject, as a space that that is like multifaceted, complex, and has like like both good and bad things about it. But like at its inner core, has something that I'd like to unpack and to really get to. Um, whether I'm critical of it or whether it's like like something that I care about and a place that I come from um, or the people who who work there and are like like invisible laborers um, so to speak like there, there's, there's a lot to unpack in these spaces um, for me yeah thanks Alex Thank you. hey <clears throat> I'm Randy um, so this most recent work that I finished um, this spring is called Synapse of Skin and Shell. And it's sort of alluding to constellations of memory, branching paths, cosmological expansion, neural filaments kind of clustering all together into this like visual patterned dome that you see. Um, it's hardwood um, with like epoxy putty at the joint, the joinery and the leaves kind of all come out together um, in these like 12, uh, 12 structures. But um, yeah, thinking about like living things and ecosystems, like specifically I'm interested in these ecosystems that function like coral polyps or amoeba that sort of grow out rhizomatically from the center. Um, so it's like uh, you can sort of see that in like the actual like visual language that I'm using when you're walking ar around the work. Um, and within these ecosystems, I'm also I interested in this idea of like in-betweenness or like between bodies, um, like connective tissues, things that extend. Like I like to see these uh, sculptures as sort of like an apparatus for interrelations um, and I oftentimes think about how architecture, the architectural structure is something um, that sort of offers an analogy for like the inner psyche where space is something that we navigate externally, um, but how then in our memory it becomes like internal and embodied. Um, so yeah, there's details that you can see along the ribbing, um, how they kind of all come apart with these like carriage bolts. Um, so yeah, I think really just thinking about like the synapses that bind us. Um, and it was an interesting kind of work to make in this moment for me. I've been thinking over it a bit. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks so much. All right, welcome back. Hey guys. Yeah, so it felt important to center your work and to you know see some images that we'll then be able to talk through. So thanks for um, showing those and talking through them. Um, I wanted to uh, read the first couple sentences from Holly Bushman's um, exhibition statement. Holly is an architectural historian and recent graduate from Yale uh, who wrote it the text to introduce the show, and which I appreciated. Um, Holly wrote, quote, by now we've read enough about art in the time of crisis or the potential of the digital gallery space. We know that the world is changing. We know that we are bearing witness to a moment of immense social and political precarity. We know that no one knows what will come next. The Yale Sculpture Class of 2020 has assembled a show which reaffirms what many of us have suspected all along. Beneath the platitudes, the think pieces, the speculating, the head scratching, the artists are quietly and deftly making work which exceeds the overwrought theorizing of the moment, end quote. And that felt like a way to introduce, of course, the context of the fact we're having a conversation on Zoom. If you had said six months ago that we would be having an artist talk in this capacity, uh, having a virtual exhibition, you know, that would not have been particularly fathomable, at least to me, but probably to most. Um, and amidst it all, everyone is making work, had made work, 
is thinking about making work. And it feels like an opportunity to talk through some of that tonight. So um, I think with living things as our overall arcing theme, um, I'm interested in first asking each of you about how that framework might relate to your process. Um, some of the keywords that you talked through um, or provided to me were ecosystem, growth, witness, life cycle. So the, the group theme of living things just really had me thinking about process of your uh, individual practices that I'd be interested to hear more about. Anyone can jump in at any time, but I'd be happy to hear from all of you. Oh, um, I guess I'll go ahead and start. Um, since I already set my keyword taxidermy uh, as soon as we started. Um, yeah, I think for me, it's really difficult to talk about living without thinking about death. And it seems like death to me always serves as sort of a witness to this heavy idea of living. And I feel the need to um, make the distinction between um, living and being alive. And I think personally, the reminder of living comes with extreme emotion or action. And sometimes these come attached to um, aggression, violence, and sometimes devastation. Actually, a lot of times, I think. And um, this is where my interest in taxidermy and its process really uh, begin. Because you literally quite have to remove skin and the animals flap the physical membrane and turn them inside out. Um, and that's sort of the, the very first step of taxidermy. And I think um, the moment of mounting and stuffing then really become almost this um, timely threshold of a, of a body sitting at the border of living and just being alive. Um, and because as soon as the mounting happens, the skin now holds something, a body that is actually foreign to its own self. Um, and that is, that actually gives you the opportunity to recreate more grand and I idealistic view of that animal's past. And there's such a, I think that process of almost rewriting its, um, personal history, so to speak. I feel like history is such a grand word to use here. Um, yeah, but that, that visceral experience of um, shame and humiliation that I feel when I'm watching these animals as they're haphazardly uh, wrapped in their own skin while their guts are spilling out, or when um, their joints are really well formulated and intact. That point to me is sort of the beginning, also the beginning of the question that I ask myself, which is who really holds the past at that moment? And I feel like it's almost those who are around who are serving as um, witnesses or passerbys are the ones who get to have the who actually get to walk away with the, with the gravitas of that experience rather than the active participants, um, like the, the hunters or the, or the taxidermists or the patrons, whoever that may be. Um, and I feel like because I've been in, I've served as a witness to these, these scenarios um, when I went to go visit a lot of the taxidermists, I really wanted to um, apply this process, not only to just um, living things, so like animals, so to speak, but also to other materials that, I've fi that I find um, around me. And I feel like this entire um, idea is really parallel to how I think of um, my own memories as well as how I cope with my own personal tragedies. Did that make sense? Yes, very much. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? 
process and living things. I mean, I can say um, I, my, my kind of answer will be very short, but I guess when I thought about this kind of title of living things, I kept thinking about the experiment um, and how um, I feel like the experiment brings kind of life to certain things. And for me, it, it really is the um, force behind some of the uh, materials I work with in my, in my thesis and just in my practice. And so for me, living things was, was the idea of this ever evolving kind of um, experimentation in one's practice. Um, and I feel like that's very alive in, in the work in my thesis, but also, and I, I hate how I keep saying thesis because it, it lives beyond that. But um, in this new kind of body of work right now, um, for me, experimentation is key. Yeah, I, I feel like I, f I find that sort of live myself, this sort of thinking about how your artistic process like also loops back into like certain interests and how your your work, Corinne, like um, is speaking to like like your process of like experimentation. So when I, I was sort of thinking about living things in process, um, and my process sort of like spiraling out of my own research from. Um, like speaking to astrophysicists who show me like early video works of their 3D modeling of the cosmos um, to looking at like cognitive science, science text, um, like the research of looking at that like micro macro dynamic kind of parallels how I work sculpturally in terms of like layering and constructing. And so like visually um, it's sort of feeding, feeding into each other. Um, I, I have a, a dear friend who's studying ribosomes these like molecular machines that are like on all living cells that are very like essential to our biology but I love talking to him about his own scientific research because our processes are so seemingly different right he's in a lab I'm in the wood shop but they have such like conceptual overlap in terms of um kind of like building and sort of chains um so yeah I feel like when I thought about living things, I, uh, I mean, even to go back to what Lauren was talking about at the beginning, like in thinking about um, death or thinking about like the precarity of like what's happening right now in our lives and how quite a few of our practices had, had, had been halted or, or changed or shifted or uh, like half of us weren't, weren't able to actually show the work or complete the work. Um, I also like agreed with Corinne to a certain extent that a lot of the way that I'm thinking about my practice is about like these things evolving and these th these things changing. Um, uh, like I usually start with an image or usually start with an idea or a subject um, that I'm focusing on, uh, whether it be like a chair or a palm tree or like a site, a space, uh, a person, uh, a fictional character, and. I usually am interested in creating an installation around that subject or that idea, um, and of, often would like to employ Trumploy to a certain extent, but then I end up using materials that wouldn't necessarily make sense to like make like like a, like a whole image or or like make like make the Trumploy work. So it's just like it's a, it's a bad illusion. It just like looks like the snails, for instance. The snail bodies are just like wet sandy towels, um, but they work, like they do the job visually. And I feel like, the, like that for me gets closer to the idea of allowing the work to grow and change while I'm making it and al allowing the work to it itself like, be a living thing and, and be something that like is transforming while I'm working on it. Um, thinking about whether or not the, the shells should have been um, more like realistic and like 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 painted and uh, waxed or like uh, epoxy to look specifically like the actual shells or allow them to like be formed from more sculptural materials. Um, I think uh, 
yeah, the living things for me also has a lot to do with, again, just the fact that like all of, all of these things are like living things, like the systems that like we're working in, that we're living in, um, uh, in the way that like we're making art, in the way that like we're supporting ourselves, uh, whether it be like, like more, more of a, like a socially living thing um, on top of like, like our, ourselves as, as like people. Um, I feel like I'm also just interested in the way that the systems that we work within and under are themselves like, like entities that like operate and are op like are supported um, in a certain way. So like, I, I feel like, like the title living things for me just like felt like really like, like bold highlighted <laughs> as like, like a way and a descriptor to talk about like the broader things and the broader issues that, that we have going on as well as um, co coincidentally, the four of us have like actually quite a, quite a bit in common in the way that we are like focusing on, on subjects and transformation in a certain way. Uh, that's all really great. Thank you all. Um, this, to follow up, this conversation kind of has me thinking in two different directions, um, little prompt. So um, it has me thinking about like questions of materiality and medium. So I'm interested um, in how the medium of your work and the materiality of your work might relate to it conceptually. So that's one prong. But then also um, one of your classmates, Efrat Lipkin, had a suggestion, which I appreciated. Um, just in this kind of rhymes with Alex's point, just the idea of the audience can also be related to this question of living and perception and response. So um, I guess my broader question is, and take it in both or either direction, how does maybe medium or materiality relate to your work? But then also how might an audience's perception of um, either those medium and materiality or just the work more broadly um, come into how you conceive of making the work? Um, so one of the words that I kind of use to describe that connection of material and uh, just that connection between the materiality and um, kind of conceptual quality of the work is, is membrane. Um, and so one of the things that I love to work with a lot is these very thin, um, I hate to call them, I don't, I don't want to say organisms because they're not always alive, but maybe to me they are. These just very thin boundaries um, that separate one kind of realm from another. That's something I'm very interested in, in terms of um, how can one breach that? How does one breach that? Um, do you breach it or does it just kind of, do you just ooze into it and into this other place? Um, I'm interested in, in kind of, the movements of it and, and how one uh, navigates membranes and um, and what they separate and how you can see through them but not quite you know get to that place but you can observe it from the other side um, and so that's kind of the way I've thought about it is in a lot of my work I'm thinking about genres and how they can kind of bleed into each other sometimes, or you can kind of um, critique some of the tropes of, of a particular genre by placing one that is maybe in opposition to it um, in its place and kind of using that opposite genre or opposing genres as a mirror um, to critique kind of uh, tropes that we use in film and literature and just kind of all sorts of media. And so I think of membranes as the things separating genres as well as just like socio-political categories and and other kind of also just um categorizations of, of race and ethnicity and gender um so i think of of my work kind of relating relating to that in my interests Anyone else want to jump in here or I can ask some individual questions either way. I can jump in. Um, I feel like like in materiality or thinking about um, the medium and it's like relationship to my conceptual interests. I feel like I am interested in craft to a certain extent. I'm interested in how like how things are constructed, how things are put together. 
um, whether that be like through an additive or subtractive process. So like I'm usually, whether or not I'm using like, like materials that would normally be like used for construction or, or using like playground sand or like just standard objects uh, as opposed to more common um, sculptural material, like just interested in like thinking di about different ways to transform them and and have them have them change and grow to a certain extent um, uh, from from their their original constituted like materiality uh, to to something else while still maintaining like the the way that the way that they look or the the way that they are understood by the audience as as like a towel or or a chair, um, but also in thinking about like like the audience's perception um, and thinking about like living things in that way. I feel like there's something really, and this it was actually something that we touched on in our conversation with Sarab um, and thinking about like how, how the work like lives on like past, past the point of us like working on it um, and how in some ways the work can, can be smarter than the artist, how, how the work can do something a little different from what, what I'm, what I might be capable of, of recognizing, or what, what like the artist might be capable of, of realizing within the work and in its conception, and uh, um, uh, I guess uh, in, in the way that it's like uh, observed by the audience or, or seen or experienced, how that can can really go above and beyond what we can factor in, as as much as like we, we try and be responsible to that as, as a is an idea in, in what we're working on and who we think is going to look at it. Yeah, um, I when I was thinking about materiality, I realized that I was actually having a really hard time separating my process and materials. Um, and I think part of it a lot of it, I think, comes from the fact that I um, uh, language plays such a big role um, in my practice. So um, I tend to I tend to collect the materials and also the um, the labels or the names that are um, attached to these materials and how. Um, when those things are kind of merged and combined and um, pushed up against one another, they kind of create um, this sort of space where the language kind of falls apart. And um, on a more physical level, I think that's where um, smell really kicks in for me. So like smell really, um, fills in the gap that the, the language and then sort of the visual uh, material um, fails to provide. So um, in each of my installation, um, smell, there's a distinct smell that I think, I guess, everyone perceives slightly differently. And um, those smells actually shift and change. Um, during the time that the installations are up. Um, and that's something that I've always been interested in and I'm hoping to um, work with a little bit more in the future. Yeah, I think um, in thinking about like the materiality of the like synapse of skin and shell, the bigger installation, like. I felt like I had to use some sort of rigid structure, but as I was like finishing it, um, really thinking about the joinery and adding like epoxy putty and adding a lot of layers of different types of like paint, I wanted to like, not in the way that uh, Alex, Zach like employs trompe l'oeil, but I wanted to really bring it, bring it away from like this is made out of wood um, and kind of giving it more of, of a look of being sort of 3D printed and like extruded out as this like contiguous piece. Um, so I think 
sometimes in my process I'm sort of beholden to using materials that are going to be functional like this needs to be 12 feet tall etc this needs to be load bearing but then thinking about how to um, how to transform those materials like later um, Um, I think I'll transition into an individual question for each of you. Uh, so I, I'll start with Corinne. Um, I was interested in your statement for M23. You were talk, you were referencing photos as what you call emotional documents. And I wanted to prompt you to talk a little bit more about that idea. Um, and also, you know, maybe how it relates to the installation you produce, but also more generally your practice. I was interested in that concept. Sure. Um, I think for me, what I came into kind of my grad school experience, experience with a uh, firm kind of uh, firm roots in, in handling images, be it archiving them or collecting them or taking them. I'm, I got my undergrad degree in, in photography and, and was a photo assistant as well. And so I wanted to expand, and I still want to expand on a photograph. I feel like behind that piece of paper, there's something else, like it just almost explodes behind it. And I wanna explore that space more. I mean, I, I call them emotional. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. I think it all has to do with the person's perception. Everybody gets something different from a photo. Um, but for me, there, there are these starting points and these kind of connections that spur other kind of collections or research. Um, there's just, there's so, I like, I almost don't believe, I almost don't trust the image that is frozen in that, in that space. And so I want to explore the context of it, um, you know, beyond uh, just doing a little research on, you know, the location or, or the, the date. Um, I feel like my work strives to kind of find that space behind the photograph. Um, and for me, this recent work, it was about taking an image and I wouldn't say recreating it at all, but, but taking elements of those image, of that image, one particular image, and connecting it to things kind of um, through different time and space. And also it, it resonated with kind of things that I was going through in my life at the moment, but it was also a refusal of the actual image being in the space. Um, and I wanted to kind of present that, um, that proposal of the idea of an image but not the actual image um, within that space so i guess yeah for me that's where the photograph is and i think as i continue on with my practice like photos still have a very special place within that and i want to continue working in this way where it starts from a certain kind of image or emotional document um, for example in this installation, there was a letter that was written on the back of a photograph. I want to find those key moments of, of human, maybe sentimentality, and really draw upon them to find something, to find out why I feel so connected to it, personally. I sound like a robot that doesn't know human feelings. <laughs> like I'm like trying to feel out, figure out how to be human by looking at photographs. But maybe, yeah, like maybe, maybe I'm interested in the way that images are sorted on eBay and these and these kind of processes of cataloging. Um, like what what is the computer relationship or mind to a photograph or, or you know like what? Yeah, I guess like. I'm I'm curious about what when you grab when you have a collection of photographs what what it means or what they spell out. I can I can feel it through the computer screen. <laughs> so that's a start. <laughs> Yay! Um, Lauren, I was interested uh, in what you were saying tonight. Um, brought in the I don't want to say um, dichotomy or 
Yeah. You just, you, you, in talking about taxidermy, you were saying there's both the question of it, the aestheticization and there's also the objection. And I'm interested in that, like that, that back and forth between aesthetics and objection, and maybe hearing more from you about what's interesting there or, or what you, how you're investigating that. Um, I think my personal interest in that really comes with trying to figure out where I fit in. Um, you know, I think oftentimes, not only in terms of dealing with these um, animals or taxidermied animals, but also in just in um, all the materials that come into my space, I really think about my own um, sort of power structure with them. And I wonder, you know, if I'm the one that's dependent on these quite physically or emotionally, or it's the other way around. And I feel like a lot of times it's a um, hodgepodge of all those feelings and all kinds of nuances in between those. But I, I always think about um, that point where we could reach a point of compromise where um, we are coexisting, but I feel like that is an essentially um, unachievable because I think at the end of the day, like I live in my own sort of personalized realm and they sort of exist in their um, in some other dimension that doesn't quite belong to me. I feel like I'm speaking very in a very abstract sense, but you know, like I could never be this, no matter how much I try to understand it. So um, it's really about um, that dichotomy is really the process or the constant, I like to call it osmosis, very ineffective osmosis actually, of constantly like erasing and eradicating its personal, um, its personal history with my own personal history and opinions and constantly battling with it. Great. Um, I just want to say real quick, Lauren, I like how you have that just on hand. <laughs> just casual. Very casual. My new accessory for the season. Um, Randy, in your statement, you reference um, oceanography and biology and inquiries into neuroscience and philosophy. And I'm wondering how some of these, um, these disciplines or these ideas might inform a sculptural or artistic practice. How are you bringing some of these concepts um, into your studio? Um, I think it's like that I am trying to like integrate th these, all, all of these interests are just something that doesn't even feel tangential to my practice, but really like inform sort of um, like physical structures that I want to create in these like spaces that I see. So when I'm, when I'm looking at an image um, uh, in, in a scientific textbook or talking about certain like neural patternings, like that sort of feeds into um, the process, my like process in a way visually. Um, and I think that like throughout Throughout, like looking at these like scientific structures, um, I'm all trying to allude to this like interconnected interconnectedness of our like social and cognitive realms, um, and the only way that I really see that, at, since it's like since it feels like such a felt reality to, for me, I uh, like sort of turn to sculpture or turn to this like physical way of creating these like larger structures that I'm like reading about or talking about. Um, so like thinking about these like polyp-like ecosystems 
as like a larger poetic nod to community and like how things are are interwoven. Um, I don't know if that really answers how it feeds into my practice, but I I almost feel like it, it's not this like kind of one way um, vibe, but it, it's very it's very much like the work that I'm creating sculpturally then brings me to like different types of research scientifically and, and vice versa. And, you know, just um, sometimes I just like stalk scientists online and send them emails and I'm like, Hey, your, your research looks amazing. Like, let's have a, let's have a visit, like a sculpture meets cosmology in the astronomy department. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very much this like, um, spiraled system of inspiration back and forth if, if that makes any sense yeah that's exciting um and alex um i'll say too i just recent i just yesterday came back much needed appreciated at least change of scenery uh and i was at the beach and so your work really resonated because where i was even some of the houses had been built more recently on like raised structures which was just a very obvious reminder of as, as you say, ecological collapse, but then, you know, it's still a vacation spot. Um, and so that's to say, I'm, I'm just curious to hear you talk a little bit more about this sort of problematic of um, decadence, but the foundation, as, as you say, of, um, you know, colonial legacies or ecological collapse. And, um, you know, it's there in the work, but I'm curious to hear more from you just about that foundation and how you're trying to tease it out. Yeah, I feel like um, uh, it, being interested in the, like that colonial history, like like there is obviously um, to, to to me there's an importance to to address and try and understand colonial histories present within our culture, uh, and I feel like a really important place of addressing that is the tourist site because it at once is like the place where we're supposed to feel calm and at ease and leisurely. Um, but therein lies like, like the perfect place where like it gets to hide. It gets to, it gets to be seated within culture and image in a way where it like, it gets obfuscated by, by like opulence, decadence, like bright lights, sandy beaches, um, I don't know, like nice ice cream parlors, like, like good food, like it just becomes like a way to shield over or, or, or literally skirt over and bury the, the parts of our past that like we don't really want to address in, in, the, in those sites. So like, like who, whose land was that originally? Um, like how many houses were built on that land prior to that one? That's obviously being, being stilted up to prepare for potential flooding on the beach. Um, uh, to the broader extent of like what kind of labor is existing within those sites um, and who's, who's, who's having to do that labor, um, how, how hidden is it how, or how, how obvious um, is that labor to even thinking about kind of our, our predicament right now. Um, how, how, like how, how we're thinking about like, like essential labor um, and who, whose labor is essentialized um, to a certain extent uh, b b because they are things that either are imminent and important, like like uh, medical workers, but also the things that provide um, minor comfort and, and ease, like people working in fast food restaurants or or um, or retail, and how how those things like maintain a certain level of comfort in in in, in, in our like um, capitalist culture, but like how they themselves are are still perpetuating oppressive systems to a certain extent. I, I feel like, yeah, th there's, there's a lot going on there for me. I'll unmute. Uh, that's a helpful segue, I think, because um, we have maybe about 15 minutes left, um, but I want to and move us through a few uh, important issues. So maybe we'll move a little quickly. Um, but um, just to kind of expand the frame of the conversation, kind of the intensities and the really pressing urgencies of this moment. And I mean, like I mentioned, we, you know, COVID obviously has 
unsettled so much um, and deeply impacted. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation in this format is just one very obvious example. Um, um, but I'm also interested in hearing how COVID hasn't impacted your practice. Um, I want, I'm interested to hear like, in what ways do you remain especially, what do you remain especially committed to in this time? Um, and in what ways have you been able to maintain those commitments? Um, or do you hope to maintain those commitments even amidst all of the upheaval that we're experiencing? Um, so there are some ways in which regardless of a pandemic or not, I'd probably do, be doing the same old shit in that I think post grad school, there's just so much processing that needs to be done. And I feel like this is almost allowed a weird pause for me to do that. It's a very weird pause. Um, financially, uh, the bag is not being secured at the moment. Um, and it needs to be because there are things that for my work I would like to have and that's a studio. Um, so because it's on studio, things have kind of, it's almost, um, it's like we, we are in grad school and we're like expanding, you know, we're, we're spacing our shit out and we're like growing into these giant studios. And then it's almost like we're sucking it all back in right now. And we're just kind of bringing everything really close to home, uh, working at our desks that are in our bedrooms. And for me, it's translated into a lot more kind of, uh, I'm, I'm interested in, before I was doing a lot of stuff digitally and I think kind of speaking, not, not in this case, but like in previous cases of doing all these Zoom meetings, I've kind of wanted to remove my work off the screen and do more works on paper. Um, I also am driven now to do more sort of writing. Um, and I feel like a total kind of, I don't know, skeptic. I just sometimes, digital things disappear. And I, I want more of a permanence with the kind of works on paper. And so if anything, the things that have remained consistent is, uh, and I have to tell myself this and coach myself all as well, because there are days, some days I'm weaker than others, but that there's no doubt in my mind that I'm an artist. That is the consistent thing. And the practice comes and goes, it is what it is. Um, I'm trying to live within my means, and that means also make within my means. So I feel like these are all things that we would have to do anyways, but with COVID, we're just, we're just maybe um, having to be a bit more frugal and, and, and things like that. So that's all I have to say about that. Yeah, I, I, really, uh, I really agree with that. Um, I felt really privileged uh to like have the space that we had to have the space uh and resources that we had in the school and to be cut off in the way that we were felt um very quick um and sort of since then like e even up until <laughs> just just yesterday uh just like having to move at a pace um and, and trying to have like like a certain level of preparedness to try and make sure that I am just going to be able to like have a place to stay like was so pertinent that it seemed really difficult to have said studio practice so I feel like uh sad that I haven't been able to focus directly on the work that I had been making uh in in the spring um but I feel like what I have been trying to do is just like keep my hands busy keep my hands busy like be attentive to like like uh craft and like opportunities that are around me. Like I've been sewing a lot more uh, than I have in like a long time. Like I started like making, making masks um, when all of this started. And then I like started seeing like opportunities for upholstery um, or like thinking about like doing things with, um, with like wood as well. But again, like still like all things around the house or, or, or like the apartment, <laughs> like Corinne is saying, like, like all, all the things that are in my general vicinity that I, that I am now like, again, more attentive to because I'm being forced to operate and, and be observant of, of this space um, uh, more often. So thinking about 
where the studio actually lies um, and what opportunities can come from like possibly working outside even <laughs> as, as, as a way to try and navigate. I, obviously like, again, like, like I'm an artist, I'll always be an artist, uh, like Corinne was saying, and more so just trying to keep myself busy in a way so that like when I do have the opportunity to have a space again or when I do have the opportunity to be closer to a community and be be more integrated um, uh, with my with my peers um, in, in physical co-presence as opposed to just uh, online in a conversation like this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have those, those those muscles and those things worked out rather than feeling rusty and like I've lost any of that because um, I wasn't staying active or wasn't wasn't staying um, present. Yeah, I think to, to jump in on that, like just because we missed out on the last few months of our studios, it like, doesn't mean that our studio practices didn't continue in different ways. Um, like with COVID, um, like I, ideas don't stop flowing. Of course, they were sort of directed in different, different areas, but um, I see for me, it's sort of like, um, in this sort of like therapeutic way, like I, I need to, I need to be working with my hands. I need to be reading. I need to be like digesting, um, things externally. And that, that didn't stop during COVID. It was like, okay, well now I have the time in the space and nobody else is dictating my schedule and I don't have to be at X and X place for so-and-so critique at this time. So let's get to reading and let's get to thinking and sketching. And uh, I bought like, I don't know, maybe like 200 pounds of clay throughout the whole um, beginning of the pandemic and just was working with that instead. And it was sort of just in a way like redirecting that energy um, because, you know, the, everything was still flowing. Like there's, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it never turns off. Yeah, um, I mean, I relate to a lot of what um, Corinne, Randy, and Alex's are saying um, because I also feel like I've taken a um, yeah, I've taken a break from just kind of being in studio and and making all the time and you know, negotiating my feeling of uh, feeling guilty for not being constantly productive um, and turning that inwards and um, just processing more, feeling more, thinking more. Um, and one thing I guess that really hasn't stopped for me is just writing and um, I don't mean that in, in terms of writing poetry or prose, but literally jotting down random bits of thoughts, um, things I see, words that I find funny. Um, so I guess that hasn't stopped. But one thing I, I noticed, and I think this has more to do with um, being in grad school, was that I was actually visiting my parents over the summer and my mom was, um, working, she had like a, a lump of clay and then she just started kind of making things. And then there I was sitting right next to her looking at this piece of clay going, what is this materially? How, what, how do I digest this? And what can I make out of this that's meaningful? And that's when I was like, oh, I need to really kind of do something about unlearning that and regaining my um, impulsive nature when it comes to working with my hands. All of those impulses are really been exciting. Um, I'll ask, in the summer, of course, has been centrally uh, related to this question of racial reckoning that we're all going through and thinking through. Um, and it's, of course, going to have long-standing impacts on creative practitioners and the art world at large. Um, and you've each signed the Yale School of Art 
uh, an alumni anti-racist statement. So just based on your experiences the last couple of years, how do you think Yale and the School of Art can better show up for artists in the MFA program that includes artists from diverse backgrounds and also artists working towards an MFA degree amidst the COVID pandemic? Um, I think there needs to be more um, POC representation in the faculty. Um, they need to, there needs to be more of that kind of um, occupying space. Um, I mean, as, as a black student at the School of Art, uh, there wasn't many kind of, there were some kind of incidents where I wish I had somebody to speak to. Instead, I found that community kind of within, um, within AFAM. And I think moving forward, one thing that would benefit the School of Art greatly is partnering with these other areas of study. I mean, there's so many, I feel like there's so many things that run parallel to what um, the school wants to teach and what these places are teaching. And so I feel like it just, it seems like we have the resources, I mean, these superstar faculty from just like, I mean, even within the School of Art, but then also across campus, I think there needs to be some more kind of bridging of, of, those, um, of those concentrations because we're not making art in a vacuum here. And I think there needs to be some sort of like outward, there needs to be an outreach um, from both sides because um, the conversations will just get really cyclical otherwise. Anyone else? Um, I think there needs to be um, more open and honest and more frequent discussions school-wide when it comes to um, like diversity and sort of um, discourse around um, racial and political landscape and around us as well as in the states. Um, and I find that important, especially for international students who come to Yale MFA, because there's such a dis disparity between um, what we talk about as American students here versus what others uh, go through who are of um, non-American nationalities. And I think that makes international students here feel extremely ostracized. Um, and I feel like there needs to be more than just um, screening of TOEFL score um, in order for all of us to create a more, um, I don't know, um, well-versed community. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with Corinne um, in that there should be more representation on the faculty um, panel, because if you look at all of the visiting critics we have, um, there's, you know, it's, it's quite diverse, but it almost feels like an excuse of like, oh, but we have these people who are visiting critics. And what's sad is that, um, you know, it's, it's not something that I really thought about my first semester, but I noticed in my second semester of which visiting critics I was getting super close to and creating relationships with, like outside of the program. Um, and they, yeah, they just seem to be giving a lot more, um, you know, in, in terms of like life advice as well. And I, I, I just feel that um, it, it's, it must be hard to be a faculty member somewhere at a school like Yale, but you know, it's your like responsibility to sort of hold all of these different hats. Um, so yeah, interesting, interested to see where that goes in the next um, semester or two. Cause I know that it like historically it's been, yeah, it's, it's been the same. <laughs> I feel like um, 
I mean, like right, right, right on the face of it, um, Yale and the School of Art could do more, like by listening to its students of color, <laughs> obviously. Um, and I feel like I'm a bit of a cynic, like like some someone close to me, like always likes to say this: um, Yale will never love you. Um, being cognizant of the fact of like like who Yale was built to serve, and recognizing that like the School of Art, like with within the space that we were working was still such a small part of the institution and the way that it's cared for as a professional school. Um, like just thinking about the fact that the endowment for the School of Art is like still lower than, than like the Glee Club or like the football team. And how, how like, like I want the School of Art to be better and to be more equitable and like how that like sounds so difficult because it doesn't feel like the institution as a whole, which is performing as a corporation, really cares about art enough. Um, so I feel like, again, like, like it's a larger systemic issue to even go back to what Corinne is saying, like, like not just the school of art, but like the school of, as a whole, like needs to like listen to its like, its students of color, like needs to like address like more systemic issues and issues of equity that have always been there. Like it's not a, it's not a mystery. They just don't want to pay attention to it. Thank you all for those responses. Um, I think we're at, or a little bit even over time, but I'm gonna ask one final question and if somebody wants to edit it in any places, anyone may feel free to finalizing it. Um, to take us out on a kind of communal note um, and just to hear from you, I appreciated when Alex was um, kind of noting the threads or the ways in which your work are in thinking in common with each other around transformation. Um, but I'd just be interested to learn, to hear what you might've learned from each other over the two years of working together in the program. Um, doesn't have to be specific individuals, so it could be, but just what have you learned from being in, in concert and in, um, in this two-year MFA program with each other? I'm going to unmute. <laughs> um, I feel like the thing that I've been thinking about the most now is that we all have such similar struggles in terms of feeling inadequate or feeling insecure about our own practices or you know timid or there's this sort of trepidation and 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 that happens like internally behind the studio doors but also like talking talking to people and sometimes and in, in recognizing that everybody feels those moments of like what am I doing? Like, does this even make sense? Like, why am I even doing this? These kind of like moments of crises. It, it feels really nice to share that almost. <laughs> and to also see my peers continue to make like the badass work that they do make. Um, so it, uh, I don't know, it, it's, it's quite like, gonna be cheesy but it's quite inspirational to sort of have have this group and be working through all every every sort of moment of collapse and celebration um so that's kind of what I've, I've taken from it so far um from my experience what I've learned uh, kind of piggybacking on that um is that well, what it taught me about myself is that I'm, I'm an artist that needs community. Um, you know, there's this romantic, you know, it's like the old school romantic version of the artist that locks himself away in their studio. Um, it's very like masturbatory, but I've learned that like, that's just not how I work. I need to be in conversation with people that are doing similar things or have their mind kind of on similar things or different things. And we're like sharing that. Um, yeah, it's just really kind of shown to me that wherever I end up next, I need to have that kind of, that, um, that community, that output. And with, with the, you know, glorious Zoom and FaceTime, that also doesn't restrict me by my location as well. Like that's just something that can be maintained. Um, and something that I look forward to maintaining. I think that our class is a really special group. Um, 
I feel like we all did such different work, but because we were all in these spaces together, weird things would, weird like synchronicities would pop up between our work and, and that was really beautiful. Um, and I just think that we were really kind of there for each other a lot, um, which I can't speak to the other years if it was like that, but I know for, for us, it, it felt like very much that there was, there were people behind me and supporting me. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd talk our shit about, you know, faculty or, you know, other things like that. It needed to be talked about sometimes. And it's, you need that, I think, as a person. You need to be able to, like, have people that will um, hear your complaints and, and grievances. Um, and you could all kind of um, have shared experiences around that. Yeah, I'll just be quick. I think uh, what I've learned, or what, what, like, like, uh, I mean, I feel like uh, the adage, um, like, like artists are usually doing like, like so much unlearning, or, or um, I, I feel like like these are things that are present for for all of us to to a certain extent before before we got here, but being in this space. Um, of the graduate program and being together, um, just to piggyback on like what Corinne and Randy are saying, like the value of community, the value of like, like how, like, like for in many instances, it felt like we were the only ones there for each other um, and how, how like that just over and over, like, again, w whether it be like failure or whatever form of collapse or death that that occurred for for all of us in the program, it's like like you see what matters when people show up, and you see that that community is probably the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, I can only echo what you guys all said because um, I mean, friendship. Like, I feel like I really learned to what it means to have friendship, not just um, between um, friends, but also like between artists um, throughout this experience. And that's something that I don't get to um, have with any other people in my, in my life or in my world. So I'm really grateful for that. And that was a really humbling experience to witness um, all these other people's process and how they approach their work and um, their voices. Well, I've appreciated getting to know all of you and your work better tonight and prior and um, I'm grateful for the conversation. I heard a screenshot uh, sound earlier in the conversation. Do we want to, do we want to go out with a formal screenshot moment to, to, uh, pose it. Sure. Should I do yeah. it? I'm going to count down, everybody. I'll start from five. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. What? I'm the only one who did it. Wait, you did a, I can't do a peace sign. I have to do the command shift three. Was me. <laughs> I'll send you guys that. I was like, oh no, I'm not muted. Oh, got another one. Okay. <laughs> thanks, Corinne. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Corinne. Thank you, Alex. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. Come hang out with us. That's right.